Uh, firstly, my name is Malcolm Albrook. I'm uh, in the School of History here, and I'd like to thank Carolyn for putting this series on. This is the culmination of three uh, workshops, three roadshows, and uh, it's been a terrific series. But I have the responsibility here and the pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Yu, um, who's uh, uh, currently Vice uh, President of the First Nations Portfolio here at the ANU. Uh, Peter brings a vast amount of experience to this position, and I won't even begin to try and list them, Peter. Uh, I think it starts from about the mid-1970s, working with museum, uh, the West Australian Museum, progressing through a period with the National Aboriginal Conference as the elected member for the Kimberley, um, a period as a Aboriginal Development Commission Commissioner. Uh, he's been involved with the negotiation of uh, key pieces of legislation, the ATSEC Act, for example, the Native Title Act, um, and many more. I uh, worked with Peter, I had the pleasure of working with Peter uh, at the Kimberley Land Council shortly after the Native Title Act was proclaimed. He was my boss and a very kind boss he was too. Um, and uh, I think uh, since then Peter's uh, continued to work in a variety of areas but most recently before coming to ANU as the Chief Executive Officer of the Yaru Corporation uh, he's a Yarrow man from Broome, and uh, uh, the job was to assist the Yarrow people to uh, develop means of managing their recently determined native title. Uh, but now he's here, we're fortunate enough to have him here, and we're also fortunate enough to uh, hear him speak on the, around the subject, truth-telling through autobiography. So Peter, over to you. Thank you, Malcolm, and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to come and talk with you this afternoon. Um, I might take this off, that's right. Um, so Malcolm's giving you a pretty um, version of the of my history and my background. Um, I've been here at the ANU since about uh, July 2020, just uh, when COVID was just starting to take off. So. Um, the uh, vice chancellor. I was previously on the ANU council for about four years, and then the vice chancellor asked me to if I wanted to come to work here. So I thought um, he, he looked like a pretty decent bloke, so I thought I might give it a go. And as it turns out, he's a really decent bloke. <laughs> so, um, and uh, I'm uh, setting up the First Nation portfolio. We're still really in our fledgling stage, given the interference of COVID. So, uh, in terms of um, budget issues, of course, but uh, uh, also finding finding the right staff. We actually next week we we having a fairly major uh, international uh, symposium or national symposium on economic development issues which we've been organizing for the last 12 months. We're bringing some international guests from Canada and uh, the US and also um, um, from New Zealand. But um, it's, it's quite topical. I mean this this uh, this discussion this forum of course because of the uh, recent election of the Labor government and their commitment uh, towards the uh, uh, the constitutional recognition, uh, together with the, um, the setting up of the Makarata Commission, the Truth Telling Commission, and also the uh, treaty. They're obviously very large uh, um, agenda issues, um, but uh, how we deal with it, I guess, as a as a country, as a nation. We certainly define us, um, challenge us to define ourselves much better than we currently have been in terms of our history. Because, um, of course, um, the, the nation is born out of violence, the nation was born out of trauma, the nation was born out of racism, uh, both uh, but socially but also very formally in terms of our constitution. The, uh, the, the, we still have a clause in the constitution, clause 25 of the constitution, which basically says that. Uh, that state governments can discard votes on the basis of race. Um, it was as a result of the uh, negotiations with Australia in the uh, constitutional conventions leading up to the to the, to the for formation of the federation in, in 1901, of when um, Henry Parks is generally considered the father of federation, wanting to get the states to cooperate uh, to form the Federation of Australia. Um, 
um, was kind of a quid pro quo. The first thing, of course, was the Immigration Act introducing the White Australia policy, first act of Parliament, and then, of course, um, that uh, uh, that uh, proposition in regards to Clause 25. But I'm not here to talk about that, but I think it's useful to have a bit of background to know if we're discussing this kind of subject matter and topic to know that if for some reason or another, and this is uh, tied up in the very uh, deliberate and direct notion of um, the racist kind of ideologies uh, that uh, have permeated and, and driven and formed our country from day one, that somehow we as the First Nations peoples are supposed to forget the trauma and the nature of the violence and the nature of the wars that happened on this land, somehow that we're uh, considered to be lesser than, um, than reasonable to be able to understand uh, the kind of impact of that. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, because the, uh, the Jewish community rightly so reminds us of the Holocaust um, and, and in, in doing so it's, it's acknowledged worldwide for that. But when, when and, and I'm not speaking up against it, what I'm saying is that it's interesting where the, we're measuring the racism when, when we as black people talk about the atrocities and the trauma that we suffered, somehow we're supposed to forget about all of that, uh, pull our socks off and get on with life. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm uh, as Malcolm said, I'm um, the Yarra person from, from Broome, Western Australia, that's my traditional country. My, um, I, I'm third generation Catholic mission and my, my grandmother was a part of the stolen generation and from about 1910, taken away, stolen from her family, the Bunaba people in Fitzroy Crossing and, and brought into uh, Beagle Bay Mission, which is the Catholic mission um, set up by the Trappists. Um, Trappist, I think they were, well, they were trapping as well, but I suppose. Um, the, um, so my mother was taken off her family when she was born as a baby and, and placed in the, in the dormitory, grew up with the nuns. And I was uh, experienced part of that because when I was about 11 years old, I was taken away and, uh, and sent to school, to a Catholic mission school in Perth. Um, and um, so I guess I've been around it's interesting, I've been around trauma most of my life, but you don't really fully appreciate the nature of it. It's, it's, it's how it forms, it affects and informs you, your personal life, your, the whole nature of your being. It permeates every aspect of what you, what you see and what you do, um, from your own family uh, to your own community. And then at a broader scale level, you start to understand the systemic nature of the kind of political and legal forces that reinforce the nature of that um, that trauma and that control of people. And I think we in this country really haven't um, bought into that argument. So the Makarata Commission truth-telling is going to be a very serious proposition as to how we uh, approach that, what the methodology is. But we, we need to be careful about that as well too, I think, because uh, I was part of, when Malcolm and I worked at the Sydney Land Council back in the 90s, we uh, organised the uh, hearings for the, um, the Bringing Them Home report and the um, Inquiry by Sir Ronald Wilson and uh, Mick Dodson, and uh, um, I recall how um, enthusiastic people were, reluctantly at first, but then enthusiastic to tell their stories. But what what was completely underestimated was the kind of reliving of the trauma that many people faced in telling their stories uh, about what happened with the stolen generation, their own families. Uh, and also their subsequent experience, in, like my family's experience in, in, in mission and government settlements that were, people were taken away off their country. That um, I think we need to be careful because there was no kind of uh, systematic thought about how do we support people when they're telling their trauma. Because uh, a lot of people criticised me afterwards and uh, attacked me actually quite, um, quite seriously for um, for thinking that I was responsible for the for the commission to hearing, we were part of the process of helping to, actually it probably wouldn't have happened had we not uh, volunteered to set it up. Um, but because they were left hanging um, loose fundamentally after reliving their trauma, there was no support for them. There was no counseling service, there was no kind of debriefing of the fact that they'd gone through this history. And in, 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 the, in a way I saw uh, an impact of uh, further compounding of the dysfunction that was in our community as a result of people reliving 
what they've gone through. But that not uh, being given really serious kind of acknowledgement or credence. So um, there are a number of um, my experiences when I was uh, at the Land Council and very early on in my career, I, um, I actually worked uh, as a, was called then a district officer. I was the first kind of Aboriginal welfare officer in the Kimberleys. I was in the Wyndham office and I ran an office the size of Victoria, fundamentally, mainly out bush dealing with, under the Child Welfare Act, um, looking out for the wards of the state. Kids have been removed from their families and uh, went as far as Kalambaru to the north and, and uh, all the station properties in between and and uh, down south as far as Turkey Creek or the Warman community as it's done now. But there was a little little community just about 20 k's out of Wyndham called Fort Creek. It was set up by the Anglican Church uh, as a way of trying to look after the pensioners. But basically they were, they were just these little very um, sheet iron huts in the middle of nowhere. Um, and you can imagine the extreme heat uh, up in Wyndham. Um, they reckon you can cook an egg on, on the rocks that are out there because it's that hot. Um, but so I, I went there and found basically uh, people in very uh, impoverished and very depressed kind of situations. There was one old lady who had these cattle ticks all over her body, um, lying on a, uh, an old steel bread bed, nobody looking after her uh, at all. So had to go and pick her up and then do all the things necessary to clean and try and, and I, I worked with that community for a couple of years um, quite successfully in terms of um, using their in, um, their their skills and their experience for having worked on pastoral properties and stuff most of their life and knowing how to grow things, knowing how to hunt, knowing how to look after themselves. But there was a very um, odd situation or different situation, I should, the dynamic that existed in that little community. They're all pensioners. Most of them were probably over the age of 65, 70. Some of them were very old. But there was an old man who I noticed was by himself. And he must have had about, I don't know, 15, 20 dogs that used to hang around. My job was to go out and I'd cut half, cut, uh, half 44 gallon drums in half and then set up these taps so that they could clean these dogs on a, on a regular basis. and. Uh, so that bring some uh, uh, sun toll and, and, and kind of medicine, they used to call it. Old people could clean all the ticks and keep, you know, bring some hygiene into it to stop them from getting disease and stuff like that. But there was this old man always by himself and I wondered what the situation was there. And uh, after getting to know the, the community there a bit and, and probing a bit, I didn't want to, you know, obviously, um, I was sensitive to the nature of their, their their privacy and their, their position. But after a while, when I got to know them, they said, you see that old man over there? Um, he was a police boy in the 26 when they went shooting people up in uh, Forest River. Well, you know, it was a massacre in 1926, 27. It was the last known massacre, recorded massacre in, in, in Western Australian history. And uh, this is old man called Ernest. And so he was basically just isolated from the rest of the community because he was working for the police and he um, had taken the police up 45 uh, miles up the Forest River um, to basically um, shoot all these uh, traditional owners out there. Some early dispute about having killed a, a white man who had um, interfered uh, with an Aboriginal woman. And I think the, the, the wife of the warrior who actually speared the man. Uh, and in retribution, there was a kind of um, a posse of mercenaries that went out with the police uh, massacre and, and it was quite because like, I'd heard about the massacre but to actually s see someone living from it in late 70 was quite an extraordinary kind of experience for me. I never got to talk to him about it because uh, um, I don't think he necessarily wanted to talk about it too but but the, the rest of the community knew the history and knew who he was. But then also um, when I was at the KLC I spent my my job was to actually this was post the um, pastoral ward wages in, in 68 and then was kind of impl implemented over uh, right to 1972. So where people were basically kicked off pastoral leases, um, we had this uh, internal refugee situation, I think largely where we, we deal with a lot of the social and functional issues today as a result of that era. 
with no support, where people were basically just kicked off their traditional country and all the gates were locked because the pastoralists were required to pay award wages. Um, and so one of my, in my career, my job was working with traditional owners, taking them back out onto the country. And when we go back out onto the country, the gates were locked, of course, so we used to just cut them with bolt cutters and go in anyway. Um, and um, we, but then we confront exploration companies who were then kind of taking over the, the land. Um, but um, my kind of induction or apprenticeship was a lot of the old people we used to visit cultural sites, take, take people back to country, visit cultural sites. And because um, that was part of my work as Malcolm said, was a museum. Uh, working for the WRA Museum under the 1972 Aboriginal Heritage Act to uh, help people to uh, learn about modern uh, methodology and technique for protection, conservation of rock art and painting sites in the bush. My area was the Kimberley, so I spent a lot of the time in the bush, uh, walking around the bush with uh, very senior cultural leaders. But in it, the history isn't forgotten because many of the sites we visited were massacre sites, undocumented massacre sites killings of people um, and you could see evidence of it skeletal material and evidence everywhere in creek beds uh, in the bush um, so the, the 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 knowledge is there and it's passed down in the community and um, uh, and, and people remember and people talk about it and then um, of course the but there's never been any recognition. There's no formal recognition. There's no ability for people to actually deal with um, some way of um, working in a way in which these very uh, important matters, where we've now seen the kind of embedment and the um, you know systemic trauma and it's passed off from generation to generation of our people, um, that um, it's not something that that is any um, any thought or consideration as to how it affects people today as well but in that period of course as i was talking before about people being kicked off their country where you had this uh, internal refugee situation probably about one or two thousand percent overnight you know people congregating in small little pastoral service towns from many different cultural groups in the kimberleys we have something like 30 different language groups, um, you know, and and that's let alone the kind of subgroups, sublanguage groups. It's quite a complex kind of situation. So you have many people coming, congregated together in this uh, very uh, depressed environment where there's no infrastructure, there's no services, there's no housing, there's no work, there's nothing. And then you see the kind of, um, but there is certainly access to alcohol and, uh, and gambling. And you see the classic kind of, um, um, undermining of the kind of uh, cultural um, practices um, and value sets and the integrity of that. And then you um, see um, people literally dying around you. Funerals and that's still today. I mean, the, the ongoing trauma of, um, you know, we have the highest youth suicide rate in the world uh, in, in the Kimberleys. Um, it's, um, you know, I've I've, I've got to the stage where I don't go to funerals anymore because I just uh, feel the sense of hopelessness and the, the sense of, but it, it's, it's become par for the course, it's become norm uh, in, a, in an unfortunate manner, unfortunate way that we have, uh, that be not one family, and, I'm, and I suspect that this is not just where I'm from, the Kimberleys, but I suspect this is in every community, Aboriginal community in the, in the country, where we're constantly going to funerals of uh, relatives or friends or con you know, contacts of people we know um, uh, every time and it, it's it, it's um, it, you know it's an ongoing um, reflection and sign that we haven't really uh, coped or dealt with that in any appropriate way so i think um and, and then there was going to school school was a different story you know being sent away to mission school down perth and going to it um there were uh, all white Kind of schools. It was during the assimilationist period, you know. So they that, that was called the Palatine Training Centre. Um, you know, they used to call it the school for super niggers um, because we were set there and we were. Uh, we it was one of the last bastions, not last, sorry, but it was a bastion of the kind of whole uh, assimilation uh, approach. So we were 
not allowed to mix with other Aboriginal people. We were taught ballroom dancing better than I could dance a bit of ballroom dancing than most white kids my age. Um, I could, um, you know, we had allocution lessons, public speaking lessons. We were, um, you know, girls that did, had the deportment kind of classes where books on their heads like they used to in the old days, not sure why, but um, all those kinds of things. We had to go out with a white family the first Sunday of the month with, with other parishioners. We didn't want to go because we were just kids from the bush. We were shy, you know, we went to, the, the Catholic priest would take us to the Saturday markets and we were all embarrassed to go there because he used to shame us in front of the white market. Go there with, towards the closing of the markets and then parade us around and, and on the basis that we were these poor kids from, poor, poor natives from the bush to try to get a cheaper price for the vegetables. We were, throughout our entire life, we were treated like, like that. In school, at the mission, uh, we, were, we were basically told we were nothing. Um, and we didn't have any value, except when it came to playing sport, like football on Saturday morning was really the only thing that we could uh, sort of get, we could relate to the real world was playing sport. Um, so um, these are, the, the, the Royal Commission into um, Child Abuse it did, did not go to the Kimberleys. Um, and uh, a lot of people, it's a very strange reaction because I, I didn't know about this Stockholm, is, it, is that what it is to call Stockholm Syndrome, you know? And there's a lot of people like that, and I'm, I think my mother had a bit of that, you know, where they, there's nothing um, that they could uh, question about the about what was happening in that environment, they objectively questioned that, that somehow this was meant to be, and this was right, because the, 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 the white priests, the nuns, had said this was right. And, you know, I... I I was very careful around my mother because I was challenging the kind of dogma of the church and the nature of the uh, uh, of, of her upbringing and, and her parents' upbringing and my upbringing was something that she would not countenance in terms of um, challenging. So and so, the royal commission didn't come to. Yet, you know, there's a bishop that's there running around at the moment who's, who's um, you know um, been accused of um, of um, sexual activity in the fence. Uh, today, you know, in the last the, the local community has known about it for the last 30 years, 40 years, but um, it's it's this kind of sense. I don't this this Stockholm syndrome uh, of people um, who have been traumatised think that they're captives, uh, they're benefactors. So um, I'll just give you. I mean, I've just gone through a number of different examples of, about circumstances random circumstances about this whole issue of um, violence and trauma uh, and how we don't deal with it in, in, this, in this country, in Australia. And uh, I'm just wondering how we deal with it when, when we do have the Makarata Commission, um, the nature of how those uh, truths can be told. But how do we manage, importantly, uh, the health and well-being of those people who are telling those stories? I mean, for me, that's an important part of what the truth telling is about. Um, we still have a long way to go in Australia, I think. Um, I don't think we've scratched the surface. I, I know that there is a, a great sense of uh, goodwill that's building in this community. I think that there is not as much um, kind of uh, suspiciousness or, or um, um, anxiety, if you like, uh, amongst the general population. I think that is improving. I think we're, we're moving into an era where there is uh, the opportunity for the referendum to be successful. Um, certainly subject to what unfolds with the new government's uh, plans and, and, and processes to, to try and progress that, um, uh, you know, in the next little while. I think that will be important. Uh, but there are still pockets uh, of a great resistance. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we, you know, they weaponized the whole history of Aboriginal affairs and the, and the politic of it all on the basis of the particularly conservative side of politics in the way that we've been demonized um, and the way that our culture has been demonized, the way that um, our culture and our lifestyle and our traditions have been demonized uh, to the extent that uh, most people probably uh, have never met an Aboriginal person these days. I mean, you know, I think the Productivity Commission figures are about 80, 85% of people uh, live on the east coast of, of Australia, uh, 
sorry, uh, 80, what is it, 50% um, uh, live. And uh, the rest of the country is 85% uh, is, is, is rural and remote, but we have never really um, um, looked over our backyards um, or even there's those been increased travel during tourist most people uh, during the COVID period. Most people go overseas for holidays. They don't really go and see their own backyards and understand and know. So a lot of people still are very frightened about um, you know who it is, who we are, and what we do, and you know, where we fit in, in this in this community. But I think that's changing. I don't want to sound pessimistic about it. I think that we have to be able to deal with the truths if we are going to in any way move forward. Um, to um, own basically this history uh, jointly. And I think that's really the challenge in the next little while is how do we put in place the kind of institutional framework that allows us to own it? I mean, I, I think the um, I think the ANU, and I've said this to the Vice Chancellor to the Council, you know, we should set up a national history project where, oral history project where we get communities, I mean, if they can spend $500 million at the War Memorial, you know, spend a couple hundred million dollars uh, setting up an employment training program of uh, ordinary Australians in their own communities, their own local communities, telling stories and documenting their stories. Because that's, that's the thing, you know, that uh, history is so important because people have different versions of it, but not many people really know about the truth of it. You know, if you go to the pub and you see a white fellow and a black fellow having an argument, they'll be arguing about the, they'll usually be arguing about history, about who knows what history. Uh, I've seen that many times in my younger younger years, um, and um, but it's not only about, uh, I guess first and foremost, it should be about the the first peoples and the settlers settlers you know community. And that includes uh, people like um, you know the. The history of immigration in this country and the kind of uh, the refugee situation we've all seen we've all seen what's happened the country hasn't isn't been brave enough to reconcile and, and clearly see where um, it needs what's happened and where it needs to go but i think that's also played out at the larger geopolitical kind of area the arguments we have with china uh, at the moment the kind of insecurity of we still you know don't know our place uh, in, in in the world and where we sit and where we're situated so uh, I've kind of rambled a bit, but it, there are connections. I'm sure you'll figure it out somewhere along the line, but they, they're all very, still very important and linked to how we think of ourselves as a country and where do, we, where do we fit in that as individuals. And I think understanding the history of that, understanding the depth of the trauma um, um, through the very violent times that were here. Someone said to me that the kind of the, the notion of mateship um, generically has emerged in, in history as a result of um, the kind of violence at the frontier um, for people to uh, for people who are shooting and burning blacks uh, um, to 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 escape the, the criminal legal justice system by uh, not dobbing each other in and as you know this is kind of general culture in Australia so you know you know um, you're not supposed to dob your mate in um, and that's it's, I don't know if that's you know, I can see that there is there could be something like that because um, there is there is such a degree of negativity uh, in terms of the connotations of what it really means, what about truth and honesty really means um, in this in this kind of um, history of telling the truth of what happened and how people try to avoid the truth for their own conveniences. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. It's a bit of a rambling thing. I, I must admit I didn't really prepare anything, but I just thought I'd come and talk to you. Um, but I'm happy to, if, if that's what you like, to answer any questions. I, I think that, that the, I think Australians have really come to terms with their own colonial past and I think this whole thing is, is um, you know, Mandela said um, in the dismantling of apartheid, uh, we don't want you to feel guilty for what happened, but only feel guilty if you want to perpetuate it. And he said that, you know, the banking of a nation really is from the, from the good and the bad experiences. Um, so, I think the we haven't because it, it's not something that's been formalised in a way that where the governments have shown the kind of leadership uh, to create the kind of environment for a it's been used it's been exploited because of this um, lack of understanding of history and because of its uh, ideological position uh, about um, you know which is racist in its in its uh, origins 
about um, uh, about um, Aboriginal people. I think it, it, it serves as a, a, a political tool and leverage, particularly in the marginal seats, you know, in the areas where there is uh, the greatest lack of appreciation and understanding, um, you know, and, and you've seen all of those kind of seats in the elections. I think that that's, I think that's very true. I think it's been played up. I mean, the, the, the recent comments by um, Anthony Albanese in the Territory a couple of days ago in relation to the proposed amendments uh, to the Electoral Act, which would have denied uh, Aboriginal people the right to vote. You know, I was working in that area in, in the late 70s when there was a court of disputed returns in the Kimberleys where um, the Conservative government um, sent up lawyers to try and stop people from voting by asking them very legal questions. And uh, there was a, a, somebody with a 44-gallon drum of wine trying to get some more people drunk so they couldn't vote to Creek. So it's... Um, the, 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 the way it should be, I'm not sure if Maria, I'm answering your question directly, but I think just if I might talk around it, the, 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 what Aboriginal people have been trying to do is to engage honestly with the general community and government without little response. But the ability, setting up the framework to engage is really about providing the kind of portal because it, nothing will change unless people actually take some ownership and examine the kind of situation themselves. I mean, people have been talking about it for a long time. It's not anything new. Um, and uh, the state certainly, but um, I think what's different is basically truth telling is about um, both sides telling the story. It's about both of us confronting that as a, uh, and, and within a more formal process, so it deals with that political question of the states and Commonwealth. Um, not wanting to acknowledge that. I think this is, I think because, it, but it also is because there has to be a formality to the settlement of it. That's why, um, yes, it's all true that uh, we've heard, people will say I've heard it all before, but, but when you get in, when this is a structured environment where people are required to actually uh, document the nature of those experiences, and when there is a formal requirement of the government to respond on behalf of the settler community, then I think that that's, a different kind of scenario. I think that's what the situation is more about. Uh, because it leads, it has to lead towards, it can't be an open-ended environment. I mean, it has to lead towards some formal settlement of our relationship where there is some element of reconciliation uh, to that. And I think it's, it's, it's been happening with, without that structure around it. I think that's the problem. I think you've got to, you've got to establish the kind of foundations one would have thought to be able to move on to a kind of a more, uh, in a contemporary environment, to be able to structure the way in which uh, the methodology is applied. You have to have, a, I would have thought you have to have a foundation because that's already happened. You can't really start um, and say, well, we're only gonna talk about it from 1967. It has to be an acknowledgement of, um, you know, 17, 1770. Yeah, we, we have to go back that far, I think, as a, it, it, with it, how that's represented or manifested, I don't have the answer to that. But I think the important thing is to, um, we've got to, from an institutional point of view, we've got to look at what it is that is going to sustain us in perpetuity in the relationship um, that uh, we're able to not just see this as a passing phase of our kind of maturation as a, as a race of people and as a, as a country. We've got to be able to um, ensure that the institutions are there to be able to not only document but to manage um, the real lived experience in the way that that's represented within the social fabric of our society. I think that's really the important challenge. Uh, Robin. Given you've been talking about also that, that both um, people's truth telling that there wasn't any kind of curatorship of their experience afterwards, no care for it, but but also that there wasn't anywhere for it to actually go mm. in terms of there was nothing that came from it. And so there was a sense of, um, uh, there was a problem with that. And so from the other side, that you were saying that there are also these institutional structures which can, which can translate that into nothing actually happening. Is that 
Yeah, yeah I'm, you know, I'm saying that um, it's not an easy process. I mean, you know, the, the, where, where do you, how do you structure to truth telling, and to what nth degree do you go to be to allow people to tell their story? Yeah. Uh, because obviously, the, the degrees of sensitivities is to is creating a an environment that encourages people to come voluntarily to tell their story. You're not going to get it by forcing people to tell their stories. On one hand, uh, there's a question of uh, what I say is the kind of relived trauma that people will have and how they deal with that post their kind of uh, experiences. But on the other hand, um, you know, you're dealing with perpetrators. You know, it's a bit like a situation dealing with um, the, the victims and the perpetrators. And then, you know, in, within a legal, I'm not a lawyer, but within a legal framework, there are, there are structures and proper methodologies. You, you go to protect people's interests. You're not going to um, get an enthusiastic response from kind of perpetrators if they feel that their position is going to be further undermined. So there's a whole you know, sense of proper processes and encouragement that delivers the kind of incentive, but also the courage and the trust. These, these, are, these are not simple issues. They're very extremely complicated. Uh, as, as all human relationships are, but when you get in this particular environment, uh, the complexities are so great that you have to be extremely sensitive and delicate about how you uh, manifestly um, build that kind of, um, you know, that ability to respond appropriately to, to that sort of situation, I think. Truth-telling is knowledge, really, isn't it? Um, in the sense that um, it's something that it should be part of our human makeup to inquire, as it is when you're doing research and whatever else you're doing in whatever particular discipline. But there is a, uh, I guess, a necessity to understand where we do kind of fit uh, with knowledge as individuals within a kind of whole network of what makes up our community, and what level of our knowledge uh, can can contribute back to the nature of whatever area we're, discipline, area of work, whatever we're doing. Um, there has a, there's a, a kind of underlying sense of, um, I suppose, responsibility that's in, in, in our, and it's ingrained in our, in our nature, because we always, we, we, as human beings, are always looking for knowledge. And I, I think truth telling is always a critical part of attainment of knowledge. I think no matter what you're doing, it has to be. Otherwise, it would be completely dysfunctional, dis, disjointed. Well, we're not going to get anywhere unless there is a, 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 um, a serious government, government leadership and conviction because, you know, we don't teach Aboriginal history in our classes. It's got to start at, at the very basic. You know, we, we, we are gradually... The problem in Australia is that it's to do with political incrementalism, you know, because we are so conservative and so defensive about our position that we... These things only take years and years and years to, to, to get to a, a point where there is some form of traction and benefit, perhaps, um, but you know that 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 is a. Um, I think that's the first part. Really, just it's about. I mean, look at the ANU. I suppose but part of my job is to try and work across campus um, to embed Aboriginal knowledge and teaching and 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 you know decolonising of the kind of curriculum and, and support for teachers and students. You know, I'm certainly going to do it by the time I leave, but. Uh, but I know that there's a very serious commitment of the university to do that, you know, from the council right through down to the executive and the senior management group and, and, and all, everybody that I've met on campus are very keen and very willing and open to do that. So that's a really good start. But I think you've got to start, um, um, you know, at, at the kind of uh, preschool. You know, it's like, it's like kids on board with, rape, you know, with racism. As, as, as you know, the saying goes, you know, they learn it, and they learn it off their parents. 
like um, you know, I mean, science has proven that you know, you know, what is it, the zero to six of the kids in terms of their development years, are the most um, open to learning. So if we know that as a human factor, um, then from a science point of view, then we also understand the nature of whatever the influences are that go towards the makeup of that DNA. So um, that's why it can't be achieved without a, uh, a, a political leadership in my mind. I think that's just the truth of it because it takes uh, the, the, that leadership, it takes also an investment. You can't do it without the investment. We can talk about it, but it won't happen, but you need the investment. And, and you need the institutions, structural institutions that can um, develop it and manage it. Does anyone have a final question? All right, well, I want to thank uh, Peter and Alec and Teresa, uh, the people who have uh, presented, uh, who are still here, but also the presenters who uh, appeared earlier. Uh, as always, I'm deeply grateful for people who, to sacrifice their time and to give some thought, to deep thought, to the history and legacies of violence. I also want to thank the, the people who helped bring this uh, event together. Uh, my assistants over here, uh, Isabel Yates and Zoe Smith, the uh, RSSS administrative team, and of course, uh, Ivana Ho, who has been recording this. The uh, presentations will be available on the ANU YouTube channel uh, in several months, probably, uh, because Ivana, unfortunately, is leaving us. She's been our uh, AV support for all of the road shows, and I'm really appreciative of your support. Uh, but I also want to thank you for your, your contributions, your questions, and, and the conversations that have started. They're the conversations that can continue now over uh, tea and coffee and refreshments, which are available in the lobby. Uh, thank you, um, sorry, I forgot to thank you, Sonia, as well, uh, for your part in contributing to the presentations. So uh, again, uh, thank you, and uh, thank all of you, and please join me in the lobby. Thank our presenters here.